Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen with eWeb. Um, I am not in the friendly area neighbors. I'm a SEN um, neighbor, but um, thank you to Pam and the rest of the fan board for giving me a chance to address you all tonight. I just wanted to take this opportunity to call attention to a recent announcement um, that eWeb made that uh, we have determined that once we complete construction of the new tanks that are being um, built at East 40th Avenue, the new drinking water storage tanks. Um, and once those tanks are connected to the water system, we will move on to rebuilding and modernizing the water storage facility at College Hill. So as most of you, I'm sure are aware, College Hill Reservoir, um, which serves all of Eugene, not just friendly area, but everyone in our community, um, that reservoir has reached the end of its useful life. It doesn't meet modern seismic standards. Um, it needs to be replaced. We plan to replace College Hill with new earthquake-proof tanks, similar to those that are under construction near East 40th Avenue. And without going into a lot of details, I just wanted to focus on a couple of things that I thought would be most uh, top of mind for all of you, and that is public access, the timeline and opportunities for public involvement. So at this time, we anticipate that the public will continue to have access to the top of the existing reservoir, just like you do now, at least through the end of this year. We plan to what we call decommission, which essentially means drain the water out of College Hill in 2023. Um, once we complete the work at East 40th, and that is, uh, will make us compliant with the Oregon Health Authority's requirements um, to address the issues with College Hill by the end of this year. But there won't be any impact to public use, at least through 2023. We're just beginning the work to plan for how and when we will decommission, or uh, sorry, uh, demo, demolition the existing rev reservoir and construct a new reservoir. So that work is just in the planning phase, but we anticipate that at this time, um, demolition and construction could begin as early as 2024. We're developing a public outreach and participation plan and expect to uh, reach out to you all in the friendly area and other eWeb customers to begin the public involvement process later this year. So what kinds of public input will we be asking for? Um, for property that is not uh, being used for drinking water storage and protection, site neighbors and other um, eWeb customers will be invited to participate in decisions that really involve three key, three key things. One is landscaping. So that's trees, shrubs, berms, other types of um, plants and vegetative features. Two is public amenities outside of the water storage tanks. The tanks themselves will be fenced, no public access to the storage tanks once they're rebuilt, um, but the rest of the property will be um, open and available for public use. So what kind of amenities would you like to see there? And that could be things like paths, um, ground surfaces, spaces for recreational activities, things like that. And then third is ways that we can honor College Hill's history. Um, it is a, a acknowledged as a historic site by the, the state. And so um, we'll be asking for your input on ways that we can document, document College Hill's history, um, interpretive displays, other types of ways that we can educate our community about what used to be there um, and how important it was um, to, to Eugene. So again, that public process will start in 2023. Opportunities for you to get involved will be widely advertised on eWeb's website. Um, we hope to continue to partner with FAN in using um, their communication channels, email communications, and, and other uh, channels like social media. Everything that I just shared is available on our website. I will put the link in the chat. And on that website, you can also sign up to join our project email list if you're not already on that. So as um, work continues to develop and um, we're announcing opportunities to get involved, we'll, you'll learn, uh, if you're on the email list, you'll get that information. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Um, we have some announcements from some of the teams. 
Okay, I'm going to do the announcements. I'm Nancy Bray. I've been on the board five years and I'm part of the equity action team. If you don't have a yard sign, they are free. They're by the door. Please take a sign and a stand. Um, we have a lot of things going on this spring. So the sustainability team, we are hosting two garden walks with U of O uh, landscape architecture professor Whitey Luke on May 6th and May 16th. Both of those are full with waiting lists. On May 20th, Westmoreland Park Wetlands work to get rid or try to reduce the meadow fox sale that's taking over our native plants over there. And uh, July 30th, it will be the fan summer picnic and there will be a sustainability fair hosted by the sustainability team. Uh, Equity Action, we are working on the repair of the Little Free Library kiosk at Friendly Park, going very well. Uh, they took the old one down actually yesterday. And so, you know, go to Friendly Park, the new one will be up. We are celebrating the new one on Sunday, June 11th. Please come to the celebration. Ready Friendly has a, an open house on June 11th. Anything to say, Thea? Oh, yes, hi, I'm Thea with Ready Friendly. and. Uh... We're gonna haven't had an open house in two years, so it's gonna be on the reservoir and the command center for the radio ready team um, in, from five to seven. So come on up at five o'clock, bring a chair and listen to all the radio stuff going on from six to seven, the regular monthly exercise Cam and FRS and uh, watch the sunset and <laughs> enjoy the reservoir while it's still there. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. And transportation team on June 17th is hosting June Prune. This is the second year. It's to help neighbors prune back the vegetation that's taking over the sidewalks in front of people's properties. Uh, you can get information about all of these on our website. Yeah. Oh, um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, we've got all these great committees and they are, they're held together because we have a board. and. The fun part is mostly doing the community <laughs> stuff. Some people think it's less fun to be on the board. It's actually can be fun to be on the board too. But the board is, uh, we're, we're whittling down and we're getting down to sort of a, a critically low number. And, you know, we have, we can make a quorum as long as everybody shows up. You know, one people can, one person can be absent. We can have as many as 15, but, you know, the quorum is five. And then some of us will be leaving. I've been on the board six, maybe seven years. So it's kind of time for me to turn it over. So we do all this great work, but like this building we get for free. Otherwise it would take a commit independent committee $25 an hour to rent this building. This, all this equipment I can use for free. I uh, can't do that. At, you know, we can only do that because we're part of the connected to the city. So to stay connected to the city, we have to have a functioning board. Anyway, our elections are going to be in the fall and we're going to need people to step up. And it's not all that much work. It's kind of as much or as little as you make it. But there is a certain basic amount. But uh, the more problems you try to tackle, the more work you make for yourself. But, uh, <laughs> but you can also do cool, really cool stuff like murals and speed bumps to make things safer. We're working on the sidewalks, honestly. It's a lot more complicated than you think. Anyway, just wanted to make that plug for the board. And that's the fall, in the fall, where we'll be making that turnover. Meanwhile, let's see, I'll let you introduce yes, our guest I'm speaker. Here we go. To introduce our oh, and I'm going to, we might. Take oh. a minute just to switch over the screen sharing. Oh, thing. sure. Well, I'll, while they're doing that, I'll just say that Dan and Barbara Gleason. Dan was a professor of ornithology at the U of O for 30 years. They own Wild Birds Unlimited. They have been in band 10 years. And we are happy to have them presenting on our topic, which is creating a welcoming haven for wildlife in your yard, container garden, or work landscape. Birds in the Willamette Valley. Um, <clears throat> black capped chickadees, everybody's favorite. Everybody has black capped chickadees around, and they're one of the most wonderful birds we have. Um, <clears throat> if you live up here in the coniferous woods and the hills here, you'd also get the chestnut backed chickadee, hmm. which is the most common one on the coast. There's a third species in Oregon up in the mountains, but I don't have that here. But the black capped chickadees are easy to attract into your yard. They love the sunflower like this one has in its paws there. Awesome. Oh, the claws. Um, and you'll notice if you watch them come to your feed, they'll 
take a seed and they fly away with it. They don't sit at your feet or eat. They carry it someplace. So it's a little more secretive about eating it, but partly what they're doing is storing those seeds someplace. So we're, we're going through a change right now. We're coming into spring. So this bird is going through two really remarkable changes. What is the digestive system? A bird's stomach has two parts. The front part digests insects and raptors have it, or you know, the enzymatic digestion. The second part is the gizzard that grinds up seeds and things. Well, right now more insects are becoming available. So this bird digestive system is changing. The gizzard is becoming less, it's more reduced, and the insect eating part is more developed. As we get into the fall, that will reverse, and the gizzard will become more developed because it's going to depend more on seeds in the wintertime. And that's where something else really remarkable happens, which my neurologist was very amazed at. Because you think of the brain as fixed, you can't grow your brain or anything, this bird does. Every year, its brain grows. As you're coming into fall, that brain enlarges, and it's the area for memory, because it's got to remember where it's stored, all of those seeds, and be able to retrieve them all through the winter. Now that insects are becoming available, it doesn't need that as much, so why waste the energy and carry the extra weight when the brain starts reducing now? So the brain fluctuates every year, which is quite remarkable, and something that we didn't know could happen. Can I animals. get bigger? <laughs> <clears throat> Another bird that's very common, especially right now for a lot of people, is the American goldfinch. Um, these birds are, uh, the males here, bright yellow. We've got probably upwards of 50 in our yard right now going through the sunflower seed. Now, some people think they disappear in the wintertime. They don't really. They just look like this instead. <laughs> that bright yellow you see is only in the breeding stage. And um, that actually was back was, was the female. This is what they look like in the winter. Um, the plumage, but they're still around. They wander around a lot, but there's still um, plenty of American goldfinches here. We also have not as many, but we have lesser goldfinches. Uh, very similar, they're darker over the back. Um, and a little more black on the crown. <clears throat> and they also, uh, the female, so not as bright. And then there's another finch, which we often have large numbers of, but this year we had almost none of, mm -hmm. and that's pine cisco. They like your sunflower seed, and no, the picture's not upside down. They actually hang upside down sometimes. In this case, on a feeder feeding for Niger seed. Talk more about that in a minute. These are birds that have what's called eruptive behavior, not eruptive like a volcano, but eruptive. Um, so they're up in Canada. The food supply is really good up there. They don't come down here. They don't have a fixed winter summer range. And if the food's good up there, why, why am I good? I'll stay here and eat and I'll breed here. Some of these birds, red poles do it too, and crossbills, uh, they can breed at any time of year, even. If the food supply is good, why not stay there and breed? More frequently this time of year. Now, last year we had a lot of them. If the cone crop is not particularly good in Canada this year, next this winter and fall, we may have a lot of these birds coming. They're, they tend to be, oops, they, relatively tame, but they love that Niger seed, that black seed that was in that tube, which some people call thistle seed. We like to avoid that term because it's not thistle at all. Niger is a term we're using for it. Um, it's a little sunflower right here, small little sunflower, beautiful little plant, native to Ethiopia, actually. Um, and that little seed is rich in oils and very well liked by the finches, the gold finches and the pine systems especially like it. <clears throat> we are fortunate here in our store that we actually have a grower locally that grows it. The only place in the country that does that. And so ours is not imported. We have some locally grown seed. 
imported seed has to be heat treated. So it's not as rich in oil because the government requires that because there's another seed that comes in as a contaminant. Sometimes it's really invasive. They want to kill that seed. <clears throat> the birds love it. And the, and the other thing then is that I want to encourage you to make your yard a little bit messy. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these nice gardens that were all very neatly trimmed and the, the hedges and all raked clean. They look nice. They're not so good for the birds. Things like this with the, the leafy litter, a lot of undergrowth in there. There's a lot of insects in there. And that's what they're looking for. Insects, snakes, other things. But that rich undergrowth in there is very, very important for the birds. Now here's a real thistle. I probably don't want to grow a lot of thistles in your yard. Goldfinches would love you for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you do try for the native thistle. But, <clears throat> but that little seed is very well liked the book for them, but also this fluffy down is important. The American goldfinch is the latest nesting bird in North America. They don't begin nesting until early July. Now ours here in Southern Oregon tend to be a little bit earlier than the rest of the country, but what they're looking for is a bloom of this. If there's a big bloom of composites, dandelion, sunflower, or uh, not sunflower, dandelion and some sunflower, but thistle, things like this. <clears throat> they want that downy material to build the nest with, and they want the seed to feed babies um, and themselves. Uh, they're unique in that baby birds need insects to eat and grow. It's a good protein source. It's easy to digest. Seeds are very hard to digest. So seed-eating birds feed their babies insects, except goldfinches. They feed their baby seed, they can handle it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an exception to the rule, and this is a really important one for them to have. So, Salal, uh, as you can do, Coast Range, of course, is a, makes a good, dense undercover. A lot of birds will nest in that cover, plus the food is a good source for birds. I think they're good berries myself, too. But. Mm -hmm. So any of the, the native berries, like these huckleberries, provide good food for the birds, and things like this Oregon ash provide seeds for the birds. So a somewhat messy yard is actually really good for birds. Just argue with your neighbors about it. <laughs> <laughs> Acorns. Um, <clears throat> big and they're a little hard to take, but a lot of insects bore into them, the birds eat the insects. Wood ducks love acorns. Turkeys love acorns. <clears throat> um, one of the other birds in this common is the house finch. This is a female and it's got the sunflower seed. They can easily slice open that seed and get the good stuff inside. And the males then are the ones that are brightly colored, the reddish on the head, the red in the rump area. And the females are duller. Some of the males are brighter red than others. And that red is important. The redder, richer red he is, the more likely he is to get a mate. Hmm. Females don't want you know, others. Now they, they're getting that red color from plant pigments that are called carotenoids. The majority are yellow, but there's a lot of red ones as well. The birds convert the yellow ones into red pigments with things like the house finch. But the only way they can get those colors is from their diet. We, animals, we can't make the carotenoids. They're plant pigments only. So those bright red, bright orange, bright yellow, those all come from plant pigments. And then there's a few that just, you know, they're not so colorful. Females don't really like them as well. If I have to, I'll pay. <laughs> Part of that, though, is that means he, he's got a good food source. So she's keying in on a male that's good, healthy male. He's also probably healthier because those carotenoids are taken up by the immune system. So a bird that's unhealthy, a lot of those are getting used in the immune system unless are available to be put in feathers. 
Now, that may only be for this one year. If he's stuck with this until it molts, you can't put color in a feather until you molt and it grows. But next year, if he's healthy and finds good food, he could be bright red too. So the house finch on the left, the other one you might get is a purple finch here on the right. Um, more color over the whole body of the male, uh, a little different quality to it. They're not as common here in town, they'll be more common out in the wooded areas, but they do come into feeders occasionally. Well, the other thing that, that uh, chickadees like, you can see this little bit on the tip of his bill there, that's some of the uh, product that we spread on our two feeder right above the hole. It looks messy, but it's called bark butter. It's a blend of suet, peanut, corn. Um, it's very nutritious and very well loved by the birds. Um, so we've been spreading it on our two feeders like this. Uh, here's a ruby crown kinglet. Um, he looks bigger here than <laughs> the other tiny birds. But you can see, you can't see his ruby crown, but you can see his yellow feet that are there. His golden slippers. Ah. And they like suet as well. And the bark butter is a, a suet product, basically. So we sell it in tubs like this and in slightly larger containers. We've recently been going through what, at least one a week? Just about. <clears throat> but that was when the warblers were all the yeah, well, yellow sure. warblers were all. You look here, quantity. there's bark butters created into the holes in this log, and these yellow rumped warblers love this stuff. And until just a couple of days ago, we had 40 or 50 of these birds in our yard. They moved just on. left. Um, all on the same day. Huh. They're all gone by the 27th. Mm -hmm. Go on. And here's a a bunch that are around it's a, it's a seed cylinder but barbara has spread bark butter on the seed cylinder and they're all gathered around for that the other warbler we get in the winter time is the townsend's warbler now they tend not to be in the valley for us so much but all you have to do is just go up it's taking a long time in the hills to come on <laughs> there it? It is. oh okay it's slower than you are you're i see it here so. yeah there they are um it's nice to have this color in the, in the wintertime and they love this bark butter. You can see two birds here, one on each side going for this bark butter. They love it so well that as we would come out and spread the bark butter in the morning, they come down and take it right off our finger. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so Great. yeah, I'm sorry the change did you take I didn't all these realize that it, yes he did take all this wow. he'll let you know if it wasn't his book. Oh, okay. It, yeah. If, uh, I see the change here on my iPad, but it's slower to go through the Wi-Fi here. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to have the yellow rump warbler, or the yellow rump, but this is the Townsend's warbler. Um, they are here in the winter time, so it's nice to have that color. There's a population that breeds in the mountains here. So it's a breeding bird in Oregon. But that breeding population in the mountains spends the winters in Southern Mexico. And the birds we get here in the wintertime, same species, but different population, they breed up in Queen Charlotte Islands. <laughs> they love the suet as well uh, as bark butter, so you can draw them in easily. Um, this is the, the female. She's very colorful, and the male, uh, there we go. Which <laughs> With a nice black throat. Which is that? That's the. This is the Townsend's. That's the Townsend's. So it's a very nice one to have in the wintertime, all that bright color still. When we lived just above the friendly neighborhood up on the Rain Highway, we used to have 20 of those every winter that would hang out in our bushes. And, um, you could get lots of pictures because there were lots of them. <coughs> the other warbler, warblers tend to not be here for the most part because they're insect eating birds. But we have the Townsends and we have yellow rump warblers. Yellow rump warblers are not as colorful in the winter time. This one is a winter yellow rump. There's two forms. There's one with a white throat and there's one with a yellow throat. The yellow throated form is known as the Odwin's form. The white throated is the myrtle. 
That's the eastern form. Um, and the breeds all across Canada. So the ones we get here, and we get a lot of these myrtle ones in the wintertime, they'll go back to Canada to breed for the most part, the ones that winter here. Um, so this is... This that's a, that's a yellow fruit. Okay, this oh, is a seed cylinder. There's one back there that has hot pepper on it, if you want to look. So they're not brightly colored this time of year, but they can be pretty numerous. As I said, up until just two days ago, we had about 40 of them. The night migrants, and they all left the same day, overnight, get up in the morning, and none are there now. <clears throat> this is an Audubon's warbler in the breeding season, and this is taken during a banding operation. So they're really colorful. Yeah, they, have that, they have that yellow brown, which is pretty noticeable. Even in the winter, that will stand out nicely. What was that was a yellow rump warbler. Yeah, yellow rumped, yellow rumped warbler. Otherwise, there was a butterfly. <laughs> these are bush tits. They actually move faster than that was showing. But <laughs> so bush tits, tiny birds. Um, you seldom will see just one. They're always in a big group, but they move through. Uh, it's hard to count because they're, they're all in motion all the time. They love the suet. They love the bark butter. They're not seed eaters, but you can draw them in pretty easily with, with suet and with bark butter. <clears throat> um, they're paired up now. They're, I'm just seeing them coming in, in twos. So we probably have a nest in our neighborhood because I don't see the big groups now. So they've split off into the pairs. But even when they're in pairs, there's some cohesiveness to the whole flock. They don't totally disassociate with each other. These are two females. And you can tell they're females. The only way, there's two ways to tell. First way is look at both eyes. You can see that yellow around the eye. That's the female. Oops. Males, oh, here's one of the female. Males have an all dark eye. Otherwise, you can't tell them apart. Unless it lays a bay. And if, yeah. <laughs> But the problem here is the nest is very deep, so you can't see her down inside laying an egg anyway. So go look at the eyes. It's a beautiful little well-constructed nest. The opening is not is near the top, it's on the side, but near the top. You may not like this bird as well. <laughs> European starling. Uh, plenty of them around now. This is what they look like in the wintertime. Very heavily speckled and a darker beak. That heavy speckling that you see will change. And now you're going to see birds that look like this, the yellow beak and the more glossy plumage. So the speckling on the belly is actually whitish tips to the feathers. They get worn away. So the breeding plumage on these is actually old, worn out plumage. And after they breed, then they will switch back into that other plumage. And soon you'll be seeing a lot of these. No, no, she knows. So they all understand. And and I just make Excuse sure. Excuse me, those that. people in Zoom land, please, please turn off your, please mute yourself. <laughs> so there will be a lot of these young ones following the adults all around. Um, starlings are not well liked. They're not native. They can be pretty aggressive in taking over cavity nesting native birds. They're not all that bad in some respects though. They can be very beneficial for some insects that are pests in agricultural settings. Um, and we know a lot about birds because of studies on starlings. They're not native, so you don't need to get a permit for them, just go out and get them and do what you want. Um, so we know a lot about bird physiology based on starlings. Mm -hmm. They also do this cool thing called a murmuration, uh -huh. which is this huge flock that moves in synchrony with each other. They're, they're great YouTube videos, and they're very beloved in Europe where they're from, and they're not doing well there. So Thousands of birds. What's that word? Murmuration. So if you go on YouTube, look up Starling Murmuration, and there's lots great videos. So back when we fall in, They'll molt and then what they then look like. Here, can you just take this? 
click it. So one of the one best submit. bird foods okay. that you can supply okay. is sunflower seeds. Whole seeds work well, but they can be messy. The, they open them up and shells fall. So you're paying for all those shells as well, of course. But the shells can fall and they can attract attention of rats and things like that. So out of the shell maybe is a little better sometimes. And so out of the shell, like the top there, are very, very attractive to birds. It's a very good food for them. In one respect, it's good because it, a sunflower seed is 50% fat. And that may not sound good to you, but it's very important to birds. Birds don't have a big beer gut like we can develop, but they have a fat layer that's under the skin. And all day long, they're accumulating the fat. And that fat is what they need for surviving the night. They survive a cold night by burning that fat. It's the good fuel for migration. It's you get more energy by burning fat than you do by burning car carbohydrates or proteins. So it's the fuel for migration. It's the fuel that keeps you going during the night. So fat's very important. And sunflower is 50% fat. Now, there's another seed you might find. Looks like this. A little red, about baby size seed, a milo. Sort of a pinkish tan, yeah. I call it. It's not red. It's, it's not a bright red, no. <clears throat> You'll find this in a lot of cheap bird seed because it's cheap, it's easy to do, and it fills your bag up so that you it's pay for this big bag. It weighs a lot but for its size. <laughs> it's worthless for birds. There are a few places in the Midwest where grackles and pigeons have been known to occasionally eat it. Out here, it's worthless. It's thin. That's all it is. We won't allow it in any of our blends to be sold because it's just thill. That's all it is. What's the plant? Well, it's it's, mild. Mild. it's sorghum. Sorghum. It's, sorghum. Sorghum. it's actually cattle food. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So but, and, and they love it. But unfortunately, rats also really yeah. love it. And it gets left behind. So if you see a bag full of that, buy something else. It's really not useful for your money. Um, <clears throat> But there is millet, which is a small yellowish seed. Um, millet, there's some pluses and minuses. There are a number of birds that eat millet. Um, if you have a pet canary and buy food for it, that's probably what you're getting, it's millet. It's a grain, so some of the sparrows and things will take the grain. Uh, the finches and stuff don't particularly want it. They leave it behind. It grows nicely, um, but there are birds that do eat it. And so we do carry some of that. Now, it also is very attractive to this bird, house sparrows. So if you don't want house sparrows, don't feed millet. House sparrows are the ones you're gonna find out in the McDonald's parking lots and running all around. They're not needy. Uh, they can be very aggressive. They, they'll take over nest boxes where swallows have gotten in. They'll go in, kill the babies, and take them out, and put their own nest in there. They're really not the nicest bird to have around. They were, um, well, if you see that black bib, you'll notice that some of them are much bigger black bib than others. Those males that are more aggressive, the dominant male, the one with a higher testosterone level, actually, gets a blacker bib. Those with a smaller bib are not as aggressive. So he's the top bird getting more of the, the matings and, and driving away the aggressives. They were deliberately introduced into this country because <clears throat> back in the late 1800s, you had hay wagons running through the streets of Boston and New York and places. And as the hay wagons would go over the cobblestones, it'd bounce off grain. And it makes a mess. So somebody thought, well, let's bring these birds from Europe that eat all this grain, and they'll take care of the problem. And they did a good job. They ate a lot of the grain. And then we developed motorized vehicles and paved streets and no longer needed house sparrows, but they're still here. So, uh, so the reason for the house sparrow is gone, but the bird is still very plentiful throughout the country.
Peppers are interesting. Um, peppers co-evolve with birds. And we have hot pepper products. And I'll show you. <clears throat> with the, the hot pepper, it's the capsaicin, so it's the hot stuff. And you know, if you like good hot Thai food, that's what you like. Most mammals don't like it. But red is something that attracts birds. If a red fruit is attractive to birds because they'll eat it, the seeds are distributed in their droppings. Mammals is generally a warning to mammals. Don't eat me, you'll like it. Poisonous, or in this case, it's hot because the mammals with their molars are going to grind up the seed that doesn't plant any good. Now, it doesn't apply to sweet peppers, um, just the hot peppers. This is Barber's pencil drawing, actually. <laughs> <clears throat> so, if we look inside uh, uh, a chili pepper, cut it open, all the really hot stuff, that tissue that's around the seed, is where the highest concentration of capsaicin is. That's the really hot stuff. Now, People think if we supply this to the birds, uh, isn't it a problem if they get it in their eyes? You know, if you're handling jalapenos and you wash and get a little bit in your eyes, it can sting. And aren't we being cruel to the birds here? Well, no. There are two nerve receptors for capsaicin. One is a taste receptor, which we have. And so do birds. They taste it just fine. The other receptor that mammals have all for our body is a pain receptor. Birds don't have that. They can't feel any pain sensation at all from peppers. So if they get on their eyes, no big deal. <clears throat> and there's a reason. These co-evolved with the birds. The idea is that if a pepper seed is eaten by a bird, as it goes through their digestive tract, It'll be whole, and there's such a tight relationship that that seed that goes through a bird's digestive tract has a 370% greater chance of germinating than one that just falls to the ground. The reason, in part, is that if it goes through the bird's digestive system, it gets scarred up a little bit, and once it's on the ground, then it's easier for water to penetrate and seed to germinate. But it also, there's coatings that get on it from the bird that actually help protect it from rotting so quickly. It doesn't grow mold on it as quickly. So seed that falls on the ground can get moldy before it can imbibe enough water to germinate. A seed that passes through a bird is, doesn't rot and grows fairly quickly. There's a really tight relationship. So birds love this stuff. That are, they taste it fine, but it doesn't bother them. They co-evolve co together. But mammals, from a plant's point of view, we make this hot stuff so the mammals won't eat it because they destroy the seed. And mammals don't like it, generally. We tend to be an exception to that. <clears throat> so we have a bunch of products that we sell that have the capsaicin on them. Um, they tend to be more expensive, I will tell you that, because the stuff is, is an irritant if it's strong. So it has to be produced in a separate facility, and all the workers have to be suited up in goggles and gloves. And, um, so it, it's a more expensive process to do this. So it, it does cost more. Um, there are products out there that say pepper flavor. Don't waste your money on it. The flavor has nothing to do with it. It's the actual chemical that causes the pain sensation, not the flavor. But why you haven't said why you would and, use it? Oh, yes. The, <laughs> the whole idea is since mammals don't like it, then squirrels and rats and even bears and raccoons are going to stay away from these products because one taste and it burns, it's unpleasant. I don't want any more of that. Now I will say that some squirrels have learned, if I just get by this outer 
footing. There's good stuff inside that feed. So all of our products that have this capsaicin are out of the shell. Well, really, that's not an issue. And lower levels of the capsaicin, here's a what's called the Scoville scale, um, the lower level of hot. Some of the squirrels learn to tolerate that to get to the seed. But with ours, they tend not to as much. And it's been tested with bears and raccoons and others. Uh, we don't know what the level is because it's a trade secret from the company. But it's somewhere up there in the top of that red zone. So it's, it's the hottest products on the market that we know of. And like I say, it does work. There's, we get a occasional report of a squirrel that might want it. Sometimes I have to be careful, but somebody sees a squirrel eating it. It may be the first time that squirrel's actually eaten it. And then it says, no, I'm not going to do this again. So we have it in suet. We have it in on the seed. Um, and it does work. So if you are having a lot of problems with rodents, that's one way you can do it. You, the seed is more expensive. Put it out for a while after they tend to disappear. Mix it a little bit with regular seed. There's still not a problem. You can go back to the regular seed. You can go back to the hot stuff again if they come back. So, <clears throat> and suet, we have it in the suet as well. Um, this is the egg in the suet. And one of the things you can attract to suet is woodpeckers. Uh, the little downy woodpecker is a sparrow sized woodpecker. It's North America's smallest woodpecker and the easiest one to bring into your yard. Male and female look alike, except the male has the red on the back of the head, like this one does. They're really attractive little birds to have, um, and not that hard to bring into your yard. So now this bird, Danny Woodpecker, but the red is on the crown. That's a young bird. It's out of the nest, but it hasn't hit the molt in the fall. And the fall molt it will look more like the adult, but as a juvenile. It has red on the head. Most of those are males, but some females have some red too. <clears throat> now I did a little creative with Photoshop just because the one on the right is a little bit brighter white. <clears throat> That's not how they are. The one on the left is how our birds are. <clears throat> but if you look in your field guide, they're all going to be bright white because the rest of the country have bright white breasts. Ours don't. <clears throat> And the birds in the rainforest in Central America don't. Part of that then is this melanin that makes it a little bit darker in the pigment, absorbs light and heat, and it helps dry out those feathers in this humid environment. So our birds are a little bit better adapted to that with slightly darker feathers than bright white feathers. <clears throat> Danny, um, Danny Woodpeckers look very much like the hairy woodpecker. And this is kind of an odd position, I must say. It's hanging upside down. <laughs> it was the clarinet. <laughs> the hairy woodpecker is not as common in town. They occasionally turn up more in the wooded areas. They're larger than the downy woodpecker. This, again, is a young bird like the downy. The young birds have red on the crown. Um, but they will sometimes come in and take the suet. Now, how do you tell the two apart? Because they look alike. Well, the downy is smaller, but size can be very hard to judge sometimes. So the hairy is on the left, the downy is on the right. The best thing to look for is that beak. The length of the beak on the downy woodpecker from the tip of the beak back to the head is shorter than from the head to the back of the head, beak to the back of the head. On the hairy woodpecker, that beak is as long or longer than the width of the head. That's the easiest thing to look for. And then the, the downy is a little smaller. If you see it on a weedy stock like Mullen or something, that's got to be a downy woodpecker. The hairy woodpecker is too heavy for that. <clears throat> the other woodpecker that you'll see commonly here in your yards is the uh, northern flicker. This is our second largest woodpecker. The largest is pileated. You have to get up into the woods for that. But the uh, northern flicker, the males have the red mustache. Um, 
They like ants. So you see them on the ground a lot because they're looking for ground dwelling ants primarily. They eat more ants than almost any other bird in North America. Hmm. But they all come to your suet and they will take some feed as well. Spider? Oh, no, it's okay. ants. Okay. Um, so it's a little awkward sitting in your big bird like this on your suet basket, the tail all wrapped around in there. They can do it, but we have ways to help them. We put a paddle on the bottom of the suet basket. Now they use that as a tail crop, but so they do on a tree. So we have male and female on opposite sides of our suet feeder, male with the red on the side of the face. Now you might see this one. They're not very well attracted to suet or much of anything you put out. It's a red-breasted sapsucker. Um, but they, they're in their yard. Uh, the sapsuckers drink sap. So you'll see this kind of, what looks like damage to it there. If you see lots of little round holes, that's when they're drilling for the deeper sap. These kind of more oblong holes where the sap is just below the surface at that time of year. Um, orchardists don't like them because they look at all this damage they're doing. In fact, they do not damage the tree. There are a few instances where they can girdle a small branch, but there is no known instance in 100 plus years of studying these birds of them killing a tree outright. Mm -hmm. The yellow-bellied wood uh, sapsucker in the east has been known on rare occasion to kill one type of maple there. But generally, no, they don't really harm the trees. And I, there's an orchardist or an arborist here in town who's very fond of these birds and really tells you, don't, don't do anything to stop these. These are great to have. And those sap wells, as they're running, attract other insects, which other birds come to eat, and attract squirrels and other things that come to feed on them. And hummingbirds, the rufous hummingbird that's here, will preferentially nest somewhere near a sapsucker because those wells, it will come and eat the insects attracted to that sap and the sap as well. In the east, it's yellow bellied sapsucker and um, <clears throat> ruby throated hummingbird. So there's a close connection there, but they're not red headed woodpeckers. They are woodpeckers, they have a red head. The red headed woodpeckers doesn't occur in Oregon. Here it is, and it's it's an eastern bird. There's only two records in all of Oregon, both in the far east corner of the state. <clears throat> so it's red breasted sapsucker. <clears throat> now, a couple of other birds that will come through your yard. Yeah, they're not feeder birds, they don't come to the sea or anything like that. But tree swallows will come. And if you have a nest box, sometimes they'll come to the nest box. You might also attract. Yeah, this is a sharp chained hawk. Cooper's hawk will be more common this time of year. These are bird eating hawks, and they will come through your yard occasionally and take a bird from the feeder. They don't make a steady diet of it, it's an occasional incident, but it is one to look at, and they, they need to eat too. So I don't begrudge them to come on. <clears throat> ground nesting or ground dwelling birds. Um, that feed mostly on the ground are things like this spotted tohi. Um, there will take a lot of the sunflower, they'll take the millet, but they want the stuff that's spilled to the ground or the tray feeder that you put on the ground. They don't come up and take it from the seed feeder. <clears throat> Juncos, you'll see maybe more commonly in the wintertime, although they're here all year, they tend to be nested slightly higher elevation. And by slightly higher elevation, I mean the South Hills here or Hendricks Park or, but some of them are still here in the valley floor. <clears throat> a dark hood and white beak, very characteristic of the junco, white outer tail feathers. Some people call them snowbirds because you're seeing more in the wintertime than snowy condition. They're ground feeding too, just like the song sparrow. Of all of the native sparrows, the song sparrow was probably the most widespread the most varied in terms of variations of song and in the degree of spotting and color. 
But we have song sparrows here. They commonly feed on the ground, but they will learn to come to a tube feeder. So uh, be aware they are coming. Now in the winter time, you may see one like this, like the song sparrow, heavier streaking all over, darker. But here's the song sparrow with the heavy streaking. And this one is the fox sparrow. Mm -hmm. We have another fox sparrow that breeds in the mountains that's got a gray head, doesn't look like this one. Same species, but a different variety, but it's not down in the valley. <clears throat> Golden crown sparrows are around all winter time in hedgerows and fields around here and come into yards occasionally. Most of them have left now. There's still one or two may be hanging around, but they breed up in Alaska. There's almost no record of one breeding south of Canada at all. <clears throat> Do they winter but here? They do winter yeah. all yeah. winter here, yeah. And the, the song is uh, like, oh dear me. <laughs> and apparently the gold miners really hated that song because if they heard that, it meant there isn't going to be any gold to get there. <laughs> Why, I don't know. It has nothing to do with it. That, that's the story. I have a craft in my, in our garage the other day because I opened Brush for putting food out, and it got in there, so that I had to put it back. <laughs> but I think that was the last thing up here. They, they've left their kids. The other one, crown sparrow, one of the others, is the white crown sparrow, and they're around all year. Uh, you may see more in the winter times in some areas, but they're here all year in various places. And this one demonstrates why you want a messy yard. Look at this big insect grub that's got in its mouth. She's gonna take that back and feed it to her babies. Baby birds need the, those insects for the protein rich, they're easy to digest, and they want the soft bodied insects, not the hard insects. So the adults will take the adult insects, but they want these butterfly and moth larvae and some other fly larvae to feed to their baby. So if you've got a messy yard that has a whole bunch of these fly larva and butterfly larva in there, birds will love you for that. <clears throat> this is the time of year you have those larva and this is the time they're feeding your babies. Now you can put out mealworms. This is actually a larva of a beetle, <clears throat> but we sell the mealworms and they're well loved by bluebirds especially. Um, this is a pair of bluebirds that nested in our yard last year and is back again this year for the first time ever that we've heard of bluebirds in a suburban neighborhood, but there they are. They're, they're show, they, the bluebirds raised five young in a nest box in Grazer Park off of the road last year, we mm. found out. And there's, we've talked to several other people that are, they're showing up in their yards now. Wow. So kind of a new thing. They, uh, they showed up to our great surprise, so we ran and put a box up quickly because they were trying to get into a chickadee box. The yeah. first too small for them and the chickadees were already there. And they were really mad. So <laughs> Barbara went and grabbed a box from the store, hung it up on the back fence. and All the way across the other side of the fence. They took right to back to the house of bluebirds were already ten. Wow. And they raised three young there last year. They're back this year, so cool. that's, that's good. We're not sure if they're going to take the box or not. They're, they're checking it out, but they're not, they haven't committed yet. Now those. <laughs> Those mealworms are attractive to birds. I will say that they're not the greatest food for the babies because it's kind of hard and not as easy to digest, but the adults love them. Um, dried mealworms are not very nutritious at all. And mostly just birds sometimes will take them, but they're not the most nutritious food. But living mealworms are great. Crows, of course, are also common. Now, a lot of people don't like crows. I think crows are marvelous. Crows are highly intelligent, more so than your dogs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate to tell you that, but that's true. They are among the most intelligent animals we have. They know what a ball is? They are, yeah. They're, I'll tell you, John Marshall at the University of Washington did a study about 11 years ago now. Longer than that. <clears throat> um, and, and but when they banded 
they need to know who they are. They banded some crows on campus. When they went into the nest to do that, there were two people that did that and they wore an ugly caveman jersey. The second person wore another mask, which was actually a Dick Cheney mask that turned out. <laughs> but, um, and then the crows really attacked the person with the caveman. That was the only time those birds were handled at years ago. Every year, once a year, somebody puts on both masks and they walk around campus. The crows attack the person with the caveman mask. Now, these are crows that are two or three generations away from the ones that were handled. Their well, parents have communicated. Away now. <laughs> their parents have communicated to their young, these are nasty beings, you want to attack them. What's even more remarkable is they took that mask 12 miles away to a place where those crows don't routinely go. And they put the mask on and the crows that were there reacted to that mask. Somehow they knew by communication with these crows. How that is, we don't know, but they communicate that. These are very, very intelligent animals. As a result, they're a little mischievous sometimes. So, you know, we've had one come down and pull the tail of our cat, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and I had one, which years ago in the house was rummaging through the gutter, trying to find, we fed filberts at the time. And they would look through and try and find some that got into the rain gutters. And uh, one accidentally knocked one down the spout. And it rattled and made all kinds of noises and startled a squirrel down below. Well, the crow hole, this is great fun. He went and found everyone he could find. He walked it in the sky, looked over the edge. <laughs> they seem to have conventions sometimes. In this yes, case. they are. There are large numbers of crows. We don't have the big numbers that they have in the east. We get hundreds and hundreds of crows in some places here. Mm -hmm. They have thousands, thousands that gather every night. There. Yeah, there's a big tree behind my house where they mm -hmm. like to hang out. They're cousins. The jays are also highly intelligent. So uh, if you're up in the coniferous forest, you'll get the Stellar's jay, the one with the crest here. <clears throat> we do not have blue jays in Oregon. This is the blue jay. That's the real blue jay. It's in the east. It does have a crest. But our jay with the crest, which is blue but not a blue jay, <laughs> is the Stellar's jay. And then all over the valley floor is the Western scrub jay, or California scrub jay, it's now called it actually. Um, so it lacks the crest, but it has, uh, there are several different scrub jays across the country. There's one in Florida, there's one in Nevada, which is paler than this and doesn't have this sort of partial <laughs> necklace that this one has. Um, but this is the Oops, California sorry. scrub jay. I don't know why it's showing my screen. It's, they're all over the West Coast. Um, they, it used to be that they weren't in Washington. They have now spread north into Washington. <clears throat> you may get nuthatches. The red-breasted nuthatch especially uh, will come in. They love the seed and they love the suet. Um, if somebody tries to sell you a box for red-breasted nuthatches, don't buy it. They will not come to a box. Mm -hmm. They want to excavate their own cavity. A white-breasted nuthatch will come to a box. Red-breasted will not. Mm -hmm. But there are red-breasted nuthatch boxes out there you can buy. Mm -hmm. Don't waste your money. <laughs> What's just arrived in the last couple days now are black-headed gross beaks. Yeah. And they'll be coming into your yards now for the suet and maybe some seed, and then they'll disperse up into the woods for breeding. And then you may see them again in the fall before they head back to Mexico for the winter. This is the male where uh, it gets its name. The female doesn't have the black head, like many birds, they're named for the male village. <laughs> and the other gross beak we have, which is turning up now, in some numbers, uh, is the evening gross beak. Evening gross beaks are beautiful, they're kind of noisy, they don't have a really good of a song at all. Um, and they disappeared for many years. They were almost completely gone 
and they, they've recovered, and we now have good numbers of even growth sticks coming back again. Um, there's still something of a mystery as to why uh, all across the country, it wasn't just here. Um, some of the major breeding areas in Canada were logged, part of it. But, <clears throat> but they're coming back in, in good numbers now. So the hummingbird I mentioned, uh, the Rufus hummingbird, it's a close association with sap suckers. This is the Anna's hummingbird, the male of this gorgeous uh, coloration there. It, they, it's very directional. He looks mm -hmm. one direction, it looks black. He turns his head slightly, and it's bright uh, violet, magenta. They use that as a signaling device to females. Mm -hmm. He stands there and he turns his head, catches her attention. Um, <clears throat> these birds winter all hit here. Even though it's freezing temperatures, they have a place in the country, Northwest, that has hummingbirds all winter long, routinely. Um, they go into torpor at night, but they survive our cold temperatures just fine. Mm. We think of them as fragile birds, but they're not. Um, a pygmy shrew that's about the size of a hummingbird has a lifespan of about eight months. This bird has a lifespan of 10 to 12 years. Wow. Where do they, where do they burrow down in the snow and stuff? I mean, they, can they don't. They, they go undercover in um, bushes. evergreen bushes. Take a little shelter there. Um, they're active all day, sleeping back, but then they go into torpor at night and their body temperature drops. It's sort of like hibernation, but it's only for a few hours. Um, they don't drop to ambient temperatures, however. The body temperature of this bird, when it's fully active, is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. When it's in torpor, it's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm but not lower, even if the temperature's outside your 20. <clears throat> cool. So they depend on your, your feeders, but there are plenty of insects still around, even in the cold winter time, they green from the surfaces of the leaves and they need those insects. They can only live on sugar water for about 10 days. Um, we like these kind of uh, feeders that, that are discs, they're easy to clean, they're not um, dripping like the jar feeders do. Um, <clears throat> it has a high perch, so you can see it easily. And one other thing that I'll mention, you notice that the little flower embossings around the, the holes are red. Many of them are yellow in places. Yellow attracts insects. Insects don't see red well. We keep ours red, it attracts the hummingbirds fine, but the insects like the wasps aren't as attracted to the red ones as they are to the yellow ones. That's why ours are kept. And we're not trying to feed insects. Right. <laughs> With this feeder. <laughs> so here's the Rufus hummingbird, and it's it arrives mid-March and is here until about mid-July. <clears throat> For its body size, it's the longest migrant of any bird in the world, really. It, it ranges from Southern Alaska all the way down into Central America, that little tiny body. Now there's something, here it is sitting, uh, the male here, it's a nice rufous color, but there's something really fascinating that we've just learned in the last year or two. Birds don't have a sense of smell by and large. Vultures do and seabirds do, but generally we say birds don't have a sense of smell. We're finding that birds do have a sense of smell, but it's very limited. And male ducks can smell female ducks and that's about all, things like that. <laughs> we just found out about a year ago that hummingbirds have a sense of smell. And they approach a flower, they insert their beak just into the tip, and they sniff it. <laughs> and what they're sniffing for is to see if they can smell wasps mm. or some kinds of ants. The reason is twofold. One is both of those could be a danger to that tiny hummingbird that 
penetrated on the inside. The wasp, especially, could be dangerous to them. But more importantly, why spend the energy to go inside a flower, poke inside, try and find some nectar? If it smells one of these two insects that have just been in there, they would have drained all the nectar out. So let's go to another flower that doesn't have an insect smell. By that time that scent is gone, the flower has produced more nectar again. So sniff, if it smells like insects, let's go someplace else. If you don't smell it, it's going in and drink the nectar. <clears throat> that long tongue, wouldn't it? We're getting down into deep into the flower. Can easily reach the bottom of your hummingbird feeder. Now, this, this is our style of feeder that we sell, but you won't see this happening. Um, this is ruby throwing hummingbirds in the east. Our hummingbirds, it's, it's one at a time. Somebody else tries to come, we're going to chase you away. And then, no, no. Occasionally, you'll see this with immature birds that are not adults yet, just in the fall sometimes. But usually, it's one at a time at our feeders. I have to say, sometimes I'm really glad having birds aren't bigger. Because <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they, they are. seem kind of dangerous. Yeah. So what to feed hummingbirds is one part sugar, four parts water. And this is very important. Use pure white table sugar. It's very important that you do not use organic sugar. Please don't do that. The reason is <clears throat> twofold. One, the white sugar is pure sucrose. That's exactly what they're getting out of the flower. The flower is 99.4% pure sucrose. That's exactly what they're after. And that's exactly what the white sugar is. But the other reason to not feed it is organic sugar, turbinado sugar, raw sugar, brown sugar, all of those. They're not as highly processed. Sometimes there's a lot of stuff added back into them. We think it's but organic, but actually there's a lot of stuff back into it sometimes. But all of that means the coloration in there, that tan color, is molasses residue. Mm -hmm. Molasses is high in iron. If, if all they're fed is a diet with organic sugar, they will die. Invariably, they will die. It poisons the liver and it destroys the gut. It's a slow death, but it's a certain death if all they have is organic sugar. Please don't it's, use it's it. The, it's the iron that's in the molasses yeah. that's toxic. And part of this was first found out how bad it was from an aviary in Arizona where they lost 27 of their 28 hummingbirds mm -hmm. because they were using organic sugar to feed them in necropsies. They found out what was going on and figured it all out eventually what was going on. It's the iron from the organic sugar. So it might be great for us. Please don't use it for hunting. Well, um, other things like our food too. So squirrels love our seed. You know, kind of figure out any way they can to get up there to get that seed. <laughs> our, and dog, our dog barked at that squirrel last night when we were running through this. <laughs> and this way just doesn't seem to work. So we have baffles that we can sell for our poles. As they climb up the pole, as long as you put it high enough, they can't jump over it. They're stump. They can't get past that. <laughs> but if you hang it close, they'll, they'll certainly go in for it. We have suet cages, which the suet basket is down inside there. The birds can go through that mesh and get to it. Uh, except larger birds like jays, of course, but smaller birds can go in and get to that suet, but the squirrel can't quite reach it. So if you, if you put up um, the hot pepper suet, it will keep the squirrels away too. That does too, yeah, yes, so. yes. Raccoons, of course, that's another oh. pest that you could have. And there are people around here who have a lot of problems with bears. Hmm. One lady brought her full bent double. And she said, I think I have a raccoon problem. <laughs> you know, you have a bear problem. <laughs> and it's not an easy one to solve. Yes, they don't like the hot pepper, but um, some people just have to quit feeding. 
or yeah, find some cool. sort of arrangement. So we do have a pole, it's very expensive that you can get. We can get on order, we don't stock it. But it, that, it is. It has a, a winch that raises an armature that you can hang gear from that's 14 feet high. Yeah. But we have several of these out up in the hills where people do have bears. Now, these two feeders um, are squirrel proof because that one on the left there, that cage, when a squirrel grabs it, that cage slides down and it closes the hole, the feeding port at <laughs> the bottom. And over on the right, the same thing. When it grabs that perch to reach inside, it closes the holes and it can't get to the sea, but birds aren't having that to trip it. So there are squirrel proof feeders out mm -hmm. there. <clears throat> And there's a variety of uh, feeders that we sell, hopper feeders, tube feeders. The one here has suet baskets on either end of it. Another important consideration, here's our full setup, but another consideration that's important is water. And bird baths are one way you can supply that. <clears throat> and not necessarily for bathing. Dust baths work even better for birds in some cases, but drinking is important. Um, this is not a great picture, but I snapped it out the window uh, yesterday because all the bullfinches were they're drinking water out of our bird feeder. So our bird bath. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a variety of uh, the feeders, like on the hanging from the poles. We have a little window feeder that by suction cup holds to the window. Um, oh, I should say, by the way, there is a nest box but suction cup holes to the window so you can open it up and see what all the birds inside don't do it we won't carry that because if this falls off then weigh a lot a lot but if it falls off you just fill some seed the nest box falls off you kill the young and that that happened we know of one wild birds unlimited story in the east where that happened it's a very traumatic for the kids who saw it happen so we don't sell that product. We do have a bird box, by the way, <clears throat> that has one side that can be open, not, not open for cleaning, but open and there's a plexiglass in there. Mm -hmm. You can actually look in. With that plexiglass, they're not disturbed. You can open it carefully and you can look in and see what's going on inside, but not a window mount one. <clears throat> so we, we sell variety of uh, boxes. This is a chickadee nest box. And this one is actually designed and made by somebody here in town. And it works very well. It's, they have chickadees nest in this all the time. The, for nest boxes, uh, there's a lot of considerations. One thing you'll notice, there's no perch. Don't put a perch on the nest box. That's an invitation of a predator to sit there and reach inside. <laughs> what you do see is that little O, o that's around the hole extends it out a little bit. It makes it a little harder for a predator to reach inside. There's only certain and birds that will take a nest box too. Some of them prefer right. to build a nest, a cup nest of, of their own material. Yes. So yeah, not all birds like nest boxes, that's for sure. So this bird box on the left here with this larger hole is for bluebirds. They're cavity nesting birds like the ones here, but they will come to a box of that size. The one on the right with that oblong hole, that's for tree swallows. Hmm. The, the idea here is that that oblong hole, a house sparrow has trouble getting into that. It's just a little bit too narrow, so it can't get in and kill the young. But the swallow can turn just enough and get on inside. Additionally, it's wide. Birds like the, the compactness of a nest box. It helps. Spreading all out is not so good for most birds. A swallow is an exception. Tree swallows love to spread out. So a horizontal box like this is really good for them. They love it. And these two boxes then, other examples we have, that one on the left is a flicker box. You have a flicker hammering at your house and you can't figure out why, look, two things, look and make sure you don't have carpenter ants. <laughs> and if they're still sort of working away there, you might try a nest box like this, because they'll often take that box. And the one on the right 
is meant for street towers. They're, they don't build a nest, they go into a cavity, uh, but they'll take the cavity that's in there. So that's what I have. You can go out and get yourself a snack now if you want. And I'm oh, happy thank to you. Take any questions. Can we turn the lights on? Yeah, uh, Carlos, are you back there? You can put those lights. There okay. we go. Thank you. So there's still a few people on Zoom. Um, so for them, maybe we could just come up within six feet of the, the owl thing here. Maybe here. Hi, Tom. And the city's still on the ground. And I was told that if I leave, if I don't scoop them up and throw them in the garbage, they will kill the clams right there. Is that true? Is it the seeds that are falling to the ground or the shells? I think it's the shells. The yeah. shells are very acidic. And so that can kill the grass below it. Uh -huh. You can put trays under feeders, like if it's a two feeder. Like on the pictures we showed, there's trays under those feeders. I do that because we had rats in the neighborhood. But I don't want anything on the ground. Yeah. So the two problems with things on the ground, um, we sell seed that's out of the shell, so we don't have that mess with them. But um, yes, it can kill some of the plants below that acidity. It also can attract mice and rats and things like that. Even though they don't have food necessarily, it looks like there's something there. So you're not going to see what's going on. We got a rat getting into our bird feeder, and it ate so much it couldn't get out. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we had a mouse in the whole house that did that. Time. It chewed through a plastic garbage can to get to our seed that was started. And now we started metal cooking. So we have a question from Anna out in Zoom land. You can either unmute. It's about placement. Um, Anna, do you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your question? I think it's about placement of the boxes, but um, she's going to stay silent. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's probably where do you place the feed? Uh, no, the nesting boxes. Yeah, it's under. Oh, oh, under good. Nest. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where where to place feeders? Feeders nest. nest box. Box. Okay, yeah. great. Sorry, I didn't see that. Um, Thanks. You can place your feeders right out in the open. We have holes that will hang the feeders there, and they're right out in the middle of our yard. Works just fine. Um, we also have some under the cover of the patio. Um, um, you may want to pay attention to if you have squirrels, you might want the pole, if you put a pole out, oh. to be far enough that the squirrels can't jump from your roof or from bushes right. nearby to the feeders if you don't put a baffle on it. Or if you're hanging from the tree, there's baffles you can put over a feeder that's hanging from the tree so that it's tucked up underneath so the squirrels can't get to it if you don't want squirrels getting it. The, the best place to put your feeder is where you can see it. Mm -hmm. Because that's part of the point of, for you is to draw the birds in so you get to see them. Um, but yes, put it also put it up high enough that you're not going to be causing an attractive to cats. Mm -hmm. Cats that can jump up and bat them out of the air. So hang them a little higher and away from the overhanging branches mm -hmm. where the squirrels get to them. Feeder uh, nest boxes. It will vary from place to place you want it. <clears throat> the nest box in a place that's not heavily used by you. Um, we actually had chickadees nest in a box near our patio, but we weren't coming and going all the time past there. So we, they weren't disturbed as much. You, you wanted a place where there's less disturbed them. It's nice if it's a place where you can watch them come and go. Um, <clears throat> What better would be, I mean, they could call uh, the store about specific species because each species is going to be a little different. Right. Mm -hmm. The taste in this box. Could you uh, end your screen share? So the people, somebody's asking that at least they see people. So I don't. Yeah. Okay. We un 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 that. Okay. Is that better? Uh, yeah. Didn't really yeah. do that. Here oh, we go. There we go. Oh, there. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, oh, okay. Oopsie. 
Um, is there any other questions? Yes. Marlon? Yeah. There's usually at least one sparrow living inside market of choice. Well, I've seen house sparrows in there. Mostly house sparrows. And I actually have seen a house finch in there once a couple yeah. years ago. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I know that at one point the Raptor Center came down to the one on 29th. I can't remember what was in there. They Someone thought it was a no, raptor, a falcon or something that had gotten in there. I don't remember what it was. It wasn't, but they came and got it anyway. They come down to where people are eating. Yes. <laughs> oh, my. Inside. <laughs> yeah, it's most of the house sparrows. Yeah. Um, as I say, if you out in parking lots of grocery stores, McDonald's, yeah. wherever, there's house sparrows and Brewer's blackbirds. Yes. Brewer's blackbirds are native, house sparrows are not, but they're, they've learned to hang around people and get all the scraps that drop. There's a, there's a well known um, video I've seen of a a house sparrow that learned to time the doors of a Home Depot or something <laughs> to go in, <laughs> and then it would pee on the seed inside. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> actually, another... actually, there's a um, a barn swallow that built a nest inside of a warehouse like that. that learned if it flew past this eye, the door opened, it could go in and get to its nest. So, <laughs> there's another question. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of uh, evergreen huckleberries growing around my house, and I, I've seen this bird not very often, maybe like once or twice a year, come and eat the berries off of it, and I've also seen that bird in the um, Beverly State Park on the coast, uh -huh. in the mountains. Well, not, no, not on the coast, but in the forest, and I try to look it up, and I think it's some type of thrush, and I was wondering if you know oh. what that bird is. Well, when, when you saw it here, it was in the spring it was not or in the summer not in the winter it wasn't the winter time because there was it's very, probably swings and very lots of, it was in the summer possibly if it's a thrush it would most likely be a swings and thrush i think that's what i think yeah. I in, the, in the underbrush they, they're not coming out in the open very much mm -hmm. um, did you hear the song they'd go doo -doo 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 -doo. no but i i heard that song in the mountains but i didn't hear it yeah. here oh the other thing you'll notice with some berries is that um, certain times of the year, the birds come to them more frequently than other times. We lived up in the South Hill Center for a number of years, and we had, um, what was it? Um, I'm trying to blanking on the name. The of berry what? thrush? No, the, the shrubs. The, oh, the, we, had every, uh, we had the laurel. It was a yeah, Portuguese laurel. Portuguese laurel. And Prolific in berries, nobody touched them until about the second week in October. And suddenly it was inundated with robins and cedar waxwings. What happens is, as I say, berries, plants are trying to attract birds to eat the berries to spread the seeds off them. One way to do that is the red color, but another way is a way that we can't see. The coating of the of the fruit when it's ripe, ready to have its seeds dispersed, in many fruits changes and it starts reflecting ultraviolet light. Hmm. We can't see ultraviolet light, but birds do. And so that's their signal that, oh, these are ripe fruit, let's go get cool. them. Um, about your question though, going back to there's a, a cool app called Merlin. It's put out by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Mm -hmm. And it's, it enables you to take a picture and help you identify birds, and it now is set up to record sound and to give you an idea. It's not 100% correct. It's, it's known to be wrong sometimes, but it's really helpful for birds that aren't like other birds that might be around. So that might be a way to play with that app before they come back. There's I have the pictures. Oh, yeah. Or, or you, could, you could send us the picture at the store or bring it in or whatever, and we'll identify birds. That's fun. <laughs> Is there a quick way to tell a hermit from a Swainson's thrush? Um, yes and no. We, <laughs> in the wintertime here, it's going to be a hermit thrush and down. Swainson's thrushes do not show up until right about now. Um, <clears throat> so a winter record just is not, doesn't happen. Um, so and then, 
the, no, the, the hermit thrushes that are here in the wintertime then tend to move to a little higher elevation. So now if you're seeing one, more likely Swainson, up in the mountains, it could be either. Um, hermit thrushes tend to stay higher in the trees. They actually nest on the ground, but they sing high in the trees. Swainson thrushes tend to stay in the underbrush all the time. And then um, song, it's, I can't describe a hermit thrush song. It's a very melodious, beautiful song. <clears throat> um, the Swainson thrush has called spiraling upward song. Um, if you go to Cornell and the Macaulay Library, there's a sound library of birds from all over the world and all the songs that you can get. There. Well, fine. Well. Or oh, yeah, right. about birds, you can mm -hmm. get it. The which I think it's interesting that birds have a series, which is not the same as our larynx, but that's the sound producing thing. The thrushes have a two part one, and they're actually singing two songs simultaneously. Mm -hmm. There's a, a sound that comes from the right one and a different song from the left one that all come, combines together to make that song. Really. Quite amazing, wasn't it? Yes. I, I read somewhere that birds sometimes in different areas have different songs and occasionally they'll cross over and learn from each other. It, bird song is very complex. So <clears throat> there are some birds that have a fixed song and they will never change. That's it's sort of hardwired in. But for many songbirds, they learn. They have the basics of the song and they refine it by learning their neighbors. And they, some birds will vary it quite a bit. So a village friend, male here may have eight or nine songs that he sings, all very similar, but a little bit different from each other. And the song that he'll sing over here sounds a lot like that neighbor, so they get along okay. But if you sing that song over here, those neighbors fight. So no, you change your song where you are. But uh, so some are fixed, some are variable. A marsh rain out at Fern Ridge has about 120 songs. Now you have a hard time picking them those out. I know somebody who can. He's written a whole book on bird song, but um, but for most of us, it's just a rapid song. Um, but other birds will learn from, like I say, the neighbors. They're not learning from the parents so much, sometimes, but not always. But when they get to their breeding site the next year, then they refine their song and learn it from the neighbors. Hmm. Um, some that I say are fixed. And then there's some that have a wide variety that are mimics, mockingbirds, mm -hmm. pull in all kinds of songs. Lyrebirds in Australia, pull in everything, everything from the surrounding. Because the idea is with a mockingbird or a lyrebird or a sage thrush or an eastern Oregon, the more, Jay. the more, the <laughs> more, well, not quite, but they can imitate this. But for these others to do all these imitations is important because the more varied they can make their song, the more attractive they are to females. Hmm. And it's only the males that sing. In most birds, there's a few exceptions. Cardinals, black-headed grosbeaks, red breasted grosbeaks, gross breasted. Um, but for the most part, it's only the males that sing, all the females have a wide variety of calls. Are there more uh, rodents, breasted grosbeaks, and grosbeaks? It's an eastern bird. Eastern so bird? It's an eastern bird. There's something. Black-headed grosbeaks. Oriole, maybe. There are orioles that could be there. Yes. Ground-eating bird that I see at the coast. 
and I rarely see them here. Hmm. Uh, in heavy underbrush, like, like back in the slough uh, and coastal pines. Oh, okay. Not sure, that might be uh, along the coast are rent hits, which are not coming in on the wall. You know, it's another question. Well, well that'll have to be our last Easter. one. Okay. And uh, yeah, we're yeah, I think we're supposed to be out by nine, but uh, then we got to clean up. <laughs> Facebook for bird bird beds. Do they like to be near bushes and perches? Or do they afraid of bushes because they get predators or there? So being able to flee into a bush from a nearby might be helpful if a predator comes by. But again, you're right. You don't want a place where a cat can hide and jump on them. Yeah. So five feet, six feet away, they could see something coming. Ah, oh, that's the deal. If they're open, they can see the danger coming at times of the year. Okay. That I could why don't we just start classes? <laughs> you know, we'll just make a regular thing of this. <laughs> you're I welcome can... to call us or, or come in and ask all kinds of questions. And if, okay. if the staff that's trained in stuff doesn't know the answer, they'll get get through to us and we'll answer. I'm always happy to to answer any questions yeah. that they have and get back to you. Uh, As you can see, you like talking about birds. Oh well, I like hearing about birds. It's fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. People could just if if you can help. Put the of course, it only takes a minute. But yeah. Thanks, to, uh, Zoomers, for coming. And we're still working on this high perfecting the hybrid thing. So anyway, thanks for coming. I'm going to go ahead and end the Zoom now. In Southern California. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> we'll do. Yeah, hi, JJ. Thanks. Most likely, See ya. Bye bye. <laughs>